Well, the natural attraction that is the Adams River Sockeye Salmon Run attracts many visitors each year. However, this year, the number of sockeye was down sharply from the number originally expected. And a local environmental group is raising concerns that this could be signs of an even bigger problem. Mega Chicata reports. Every October, visitors flock here to Roderick Hank Brown Provincial Park to see the Adams River Sockeye Salmon Run. But this year, many may have left disappointed. It was pathetic. This year's salmon return was far smaller than predicted. That has environmentalists sounding the alarm. That tells me that there's something majorly wrong happening out there in the oceans and our rivers. We don't have exact reasons for it, but um, you, you have to think of the salmon as the canary in the coal mine. And if we're seeing the salmon numbers plummet, we should have some major concerns and it's not just the salmon. Fisheries and Oceans Canada says it's too early to confirm exact numbers, but is calling the sockeye return disappointing. So at this point in time, uh, what we can say is we can't give a definitive number, but we can say that the, the returns are significantly below what we had preseason forecast. And federal authorities don't know why fewer sockeye returned this year than originally expected. It's evident that the numbers just haven't materialized, and at this point in time, we don't understand. Of course, over time, uh, effort will be put into trying and trying to understand uh, what the environmental conditions uh, and other uh, impacts that, uh, that may have uh, affected the return. Cooperman is willing to speculate on what might be behind the unexpectedly low numbers here this year. And the major concern, of course, is climate change, and if we look at what the potential causes for this crash, uh, we can look at the warming ocean. Uh, there's a warm blob off the coast and that is affecting sea life and it could be one of the main reasons why we're seeing so few salmon this year. Meanwhile, Fisheries and Oceans Canada is still working on final sockeye return numbers, which aren't expected to be released till 2016. Megan Turcato, Global News, Roderick Haig Brown, Provincial Park. Metro Vancouver seafood markets are warning the cost of salmon is about to go up. The reason? One of BC's most important salmon runs just hasn't happened. CTV's Kent Mulgat with that story. The Adams River is looking beautiful, but the story it's telling is ugly. This is a collapse. This is a crash. It's very significant. And this is normally the second largest run in the four-year cycle. What's missing is the salmon. Normally by this time of year with the spawning over, you'd be seeing a scattering of sockeye carcasses along the Adams River. But today, you're hard pressed to find a single one. Four years ago, and that's how you judge this year, there were 148,000. This year, approximately 3,000. Government biologists say the number will be higher than that, but still very disappointing. For area residents, it's sad. We've just come today and we're looking. <laughs> we can't seem to find it. Yeah. It also means higher prices for consumers. Definitely. Price is, uh, you know, going to go up uh, with what little supplies there is. You know, the, the fishermen ask for more and, uh, you know, that gets passed on me and I have to pass that on to my customers. It was Jim hot. Cooperman sees salmon as the canary in the coal mine of climate change and it's not a good signal. If we're losing our salmon because of climate change, what's going to come next. Still, Cooperman says there's some good news. At least now, we have a government that cares about science. So he expects better dialogue with fisheries scientists as we look for solutions. Camp Mulgat, CDV News, near Salmon Arm. Still, Cooperman says there's some good news. At least now, we have a government that cares about science. You know, it, it, it is, again, uh, you know, those guys do the Lord's work. I know they've had some management mistakes. The guys who are risking their lives every day, I worked with them a long time when I covered the White House. But I guess, you know, you make mistakes, you're fair game in late night. It's laughable and troubling, both combined. After more than a year of complaints and protests that the federal government was keeping scientists from speaking out, today Canada's information officer confirmed her office will investigate the allegations. Julie Van Dusen has the story. 
Dr. Katie Gibbs is a young biologist. She says the idea of working in the government is no longer an option for her and many of her peers. I really wouldn't want to work in those conditions where, you know, I would feel that my science was being stifled. Gibbs heads up a group called Evidence for Democracy. Last summer, they protested what they call the muzzling of federal scientists and the closure of research facilities like the Experimental Lakes area. They say they are scientists who are speaking out for those who can't. No science, no evidence. Now Canada's Information Commissioner, Suzanne Legault, says she will investigate the ongoing complaints of muzzling. Democracy Watch is one of the organizations that appealed to Legault. The public pays for this research and the public has a right to know it. Critics say some topics are particularly sensitive to the government. Climate change, greenhouse gas emissions and how it relates to oil sands development. There is a war on science and scientists in this country. At an international polar conference last year in Montreal, government handlers shadowed Canadian scientists, monitoring their every word. The chill that we're experiencing here in Canada is now spilling out over our borders and affecting uh, how scientists around the world look at Canada. Some Canadian scientists point out the Obama administration has directed science agencies to make their research available to the public. They have a policy that allows their scientists to speak freely with the media on scientific issues. But the government insists no censorship is happening here and that scientists get to speak frequently. I'm optimistic that this, this uh, inquiry will, will prove what we've been saying all along, which is that uh, scientists do have uh, uh, access to media and to the public. Michelle Rempel has dismissed the complaints, but the Information Commissioner has notified six government departments of her plan to investigate whether their scientists are really being censored. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. Soma port lies just 30 kilometres north of the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant. Fishing resumed here last month following the lifting of a ban imposed after it was revealed in July that radioactive water had leaked into the ocean. As the fishermen prepared to cast their nets once again, the head of the local fishing cooperative offered his encouragement. Due to the problem of the contaminated water, I know you all have various concerns. By embarking on this trial fishing, we must show that the fisheries cooperative in Soma Futaba is willing to continue fishing. The fishermen are permitted to land 16 types of seafood. Around 95% of the catch is discarded. Many fishermen are concerned about the future of their livelihood. We are worried whether or not we can actually sell the fish. Opening a new session of Parliament this month, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe insisted the radiation leaks do not pose a threat to human health. The local fishermen are suffering from a bad reputation founded on falsehood. The effects on food and water are way below the limits for radiation levels. Just offshore from the Fukushima plant, scientists from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the United States are working alongside Japanese counterparts, monitoring radiation levels. Among them is Ken Buesela, who spoke to VOA via Skype. That radiation will be across the Pacific, but it gets much, much lower, even short distances offshore. Buesela says a bigger concern is the accumulation of isotopes in marine life. Earlier this year, cesium isotopes from Fukushima were found in tuna caught off California. The tuna were caught off San Diego with the Fukushima cesium isotopes. They were 10 to 20 times lower than they had been off Japan. Now, the new releases, the leaks from the tanks, they're changing in character. Strontium-90 has become of more concern because it's a bone-seeking isotope. That will stay in fish much longer. TEPCO, the owner of the Fukushima plant, is building an underground frozen wall to prevent contaminated water from leaking into the sea. It is also experimenting with a system to decontaminate the water. A nuclear expert at the environmental organization Greenpeace, Rihanna Toole, says it's not clear those technologies will work. They already spend a lot of money trying to, to implement them. What uh, Greenpeace wants is that the government really gets in international advice and get as much support as possible to try and find the right solution for this problem. The livelihood of the fishermen of Fukushima depend on finding that solution. Henry Richwell for VOA News, Tokyo.
Complaints that federally funded scientists are muzzled by the current government aren't new, but now there's an effort to attach some hard facts to those claims, the kind of objective evidence that scientists like. Democracy Watch and the University of Victoria's Environmental Law Centre are asking the Information Commissioner of Canada to investigate. Calvin Sanborn is the Centre's legal director and joins us now. Hello there. Hi, Paul. Uh, First off, what are some uh, examples of uh, the government deliberately trying to restrict the flow of scientific information to the public? Well, in the last few years, uh, the situation has changed where government scientists used to be able to just speak to the media and then report to their superior that they've done it. But uh, there have been new federal policies brought in that say that uh, scientists are not free to do that, that they need to get approval. And there are policies in various departments that uh, require them to uh, deliver approved lines, quotes around approved lines. These responses they give have to be approved by the public relations people. Uh, And then there are specific policies at Environment Canada that say that if it's a climate change issue or an oil sands issue, that the scientist is forbidden from speaking unless they get approval right up to the Privy Council office has to give approval, and the minister has power over whether or not the scientist can speak. Um, There's an then, edict uh, that, that that suggests if it's specifically climate change related or tar sands related, that the Privy Council has to approve it? The Environment Canada's policy, which is found in our report, it states that, exactly. Wow. Yeah, so they're focusing in on climate change and oil sands, and, uh, and then... Um, the, the other thing that's kind of striking is we have a case where there's a scientist that uh, uh, was asked a question by the media, and the response was written up by the public relations people and went to the assistant deputy minister for approval. And the, uh, an email was sent to the scientist saying that your, your statements, as attached, are uh, being in front of the assistant deputy minister for approval at this point. And the scientist said, those are not my statements. Like they were actually ascribing quotes to the scientists without even letting him know. So there, there's a, there are a lot of explosive uh, examples in our report. And how is the work of the scientists being affected as a result, do you think? Well, I think scientists are very frustrated. Um, one of the direct results recently in the last week is that uh, the government is now saying that uh, international scientists must sign an agreement that gives the federal government the opportunity to veto whether or not the scientific research can be published in a scientific journal. And that has enormous implications. It means that government scientists in Canada may not be able to collaborate with scientists because American scientists are saying, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give the government of Canada a veto over whether or not our scientific research is published in Nature or Science Magazine. So if one of our scientists is on a a joint international team... Uh, that's right. The rest of the team also has to comply. That's right. They're, that's what they're they're demanding that they that they sign an agreement. And the the Americans are facing a policy that is 180 degrees different than that. Like the American government under the Obama administration has reversed the kind of repression of science that the Bush administration did. The American government says scientists should talk to the public. They not only allow the scientists to talk to the media and the public, they actually have a policy that says it's their obligation to share scientific information with the public, which is probably a pretty good principle in a democracy. Now, we are talking about uh, federal scientists here, so they're government employees, so they don't own the intellectual property for their work. They're they're paid for that through the federal government. Do you believe there's any room for ministerial oversight in terms of how federally funded research uh, gets communicated to the public? Well, I, I think there's there's room, and that the U.S. government policy is a really good example of that. That uh, that the the scientists uh, in the United States have to say that uh, they're expressing their own opinions; they're not speaking for government. But uh, the U.S. law is it is not the intellectual property of the uh, of the government of the day to control; that it actually belongs to the public. And I think that that's that's a law that needs to be. Uh, emulated here in Canada, because it's so essential to a democracy. Like, we can't make really uh, smart decisions about climate change if we don't have access to the facts. And uh, so, um, 
I mean, this has been a long-standing kind of tension between government and scientists going back to Galileo. Remember, the authorities threw Galileo in prison because he kept insisting that the Earth went around the sun. Mm. Uh, but science is pretty darn important. You know, if we're going to make decisions that, that make sense um, around pollution and sea lice on fish and, and uh, climate change, uh, we can't do that without the facts. And, the, and it's very dangerous if... if uh, politicians manipulate the facts. So don't look at this research as government-owned, it's public-owned. That's exactly right. That's the American position, and it should be the Canadian position. Uh, uh, in, yeah. in a democracy, it, it's pretty es essential. You have uh, filed this request with the information commissioner. Wh what happens now? Uh, what are they obliged to do with, with this request? Okay, so we've asked the commissioner to conduct an investigation under Section 30 of the Access to Information Act, and then uh, she would be issuing a report to Parliament and the public on the situation. And she, she doesn't have uh, legal powers herself to change things, but she can make recommendations and report. And I'm quite confident that uh, when she reports on the situation, that the public will, will demand that uh, there no longer be this uh, suppression of science, that people will, will look at this and realize the negative ramifications if, uh, if taxpayers are not allowed to access the information that they've paid for that may illuminate the best way of dealing with the very complex problems that our society faces. With this complaint in, is she bound to report now? She has the discretion to report. Okay. Yeah, but we're, we're, what we're saying is that there's no more important job for an information commissioner than to investigate a situation where there is a systematic obstruction of the public's access to uh, publicly owned scientific knowledge. Mm. Well, I appreciate your thoughts today. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Legal Director at the University of Victoria's Environmental Law Center, that's Calvin Sanborn. Your thoughts on what he's had to say, 1-855-SHIFT-NB, that's 1-855-SHIFT-NB, or send us an email at shift at cbc.ca. Should government scientists be allowed to speak freely about the work they do for the government?